male, female, transgender, gender dysphoria? What do these terms mean? And how does the Bible address the sexual ethics of today that are impacting so many of our kids and families? That's coming up. Stay with me. Welcome to this edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. We are a discipleship-driven ministry on a mission to encourage Christians everywhere to live like Christians. Well, thanks for joining us today as we continue our series, Caring Enough to Confront, bringing light, not heat, to the most critical issues of our day. So far, we've used the lens of God's Word to study topics like abortion, politics, and homosexuality. And in just a minute, our guest teacher, Pastor Tim Lundy, will focus on the newest and probably most complicated aspect of today's sexual ethic, transgenderism. But before he dives in, let me encourage you to use our message notes while you listen. They include Tim's brief outline, all the supporting scripture he uses, and more. Get them under the Broadcasts tab at livingontheedge.org. App listeners, tap Fill in Notes. Okay, here now is Pastor Tim Lundy with his talk, Transgender Issues and the Bible. We're talking about some issues that I think are so important to our times that we as Christians need to talk about them, especially as the rest of the culture is. And some have even questioned that. They said, does does the Bible really speak to these issues today? You just need to know as a people, as a church, we believe that the Bible speaks to all of life, that it's still accurate and relevant for all of life. And to the best of our ability, we wanna guide our lives, every area of our life, but especially our sex lives and our understanding of ourselves according to what God's revealed in his word. Now, you may not accept that. I I get that. I'm glad that you're here anyway. I think some of these issues need to be talked about just based on what's going on in the world today. But as people who take the Bible seriously, we're trying to align our lives to it to the best of our ability. And so that's why it needs to be explained, especially in a fast-moving culture today. I would just say out of the beginning, as Christians, our approach to sex and gender must be marked by grace and truth. It's got to be marked by grace and truth. That's how Jesus came. He was a man full of grace and truth. And he extended grace to all people, no matter where they're coming from. I want you to hear this explicitly from me. No matter where you're coming from, no matter what you've done, no matter even if you disagree with me, man, the grace of Jesus Christ is for all people. But he's also a man of truth that he recognized that lies kill people. In fact, remember how he talked about Satan? He talked about himself. He says, the evil one comes to lie and kill and destroy. He loves killing life. But I came to bring the truth because truth sets you free. Now, particularly on this issue, when we approach transgender issues, we need to protect against the ideology while still caring about the individual. And here's why I'd say it this way. Because this is such a, rapid changing and moving movement right now. I would say in the last five years, we've seen more movement and change in the culture on this. And as a church, in a lot of ways, we're reacting. And I would just caution us in the same way that we look at how we responded to the homosexual movement. In a lot of ways, we didn't respond well or we overacted in places or we spoke out. We used humor. We used different things they're really damaging. And so we're having to kind of rebuild while at the same time still holding on to truth. I would say when it comes to this transgender movement, it's easy for us at times to maybe overspeak or to react in certain ways. And we gotta hold this balance. And this is what I want you to hear. There's an ideology that's sweeping through this country and it's sweeping through our young people and it's sweeping through the schools. And parents, by the way, are being pulled out of the equation. And so we've got to step forward and go, hey, where do we speak against a movement that frankly is lying and killing and destroying? While at the same time recognizing there's individuals and they're they're dealing with it at an individual basis. And young people are not just an ideology, they're people. And how do we deal with them as people? I love how Jesus did it. 
Notice what he said. He said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hard hand is not the shepherd. He does not own the sheep. So when the wolf is coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Jesus said, I am such a good shepherd, I protect my own. I protect my sheep. When any wolf comes in, anybody comes in, whether it's an ideology, whether it's a lie, whether it's anything that the evil one wants to do, Jesus stands full front and he says, I protect my own. So he protected his own. But he was also the same savior that always went after the one. No matter where they'd gone no matter what they're struggling with. And so as we talk about this today, there'll be places I need to speak truth strong and you need to feel that. But in the same way, today you might be the one here who's struggling. And you need to know that there's a savior that we serve. The reason we're so crazy about him, the reason we align our lives to this Bible is he goes after everyone and he makes a difference for everyone. So as we say that, let me jump in with some terms. And again, I'm a little wary to do this because there's so many terms. And I'll just say right at the outset, I've simplified in some ways. Now I think that's part of the strategy of the evil one. He wants to confuse us. And so he's created a thousand categories of everything in confusion. There's a few simple terms that you need to grab as you jump in this. All right, the first one is sex. And let me be clear, for the rest of this message, when I use the term sex, I'm not talking about having sex, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about the act of sex, I'm talking biological sex, okay? So it refers to a person's biological status and is typically categorized as male, female, or intersex. And so every person is categorized, your body, and, and it used to be, it was pretty simple. When you had a baby, what did the doctor declare? It's a boy, it's a girl. Now, that's no longer the case. It's called you were assigned at birth. In other words, the doctor may say that about you, but that's not who you really are. You see that the shift in thinking with that? And so biological sex is your body. Now, intersex, there's a, a rare condition and it's rare. Again, I keep seeing numbers. One of the strategies of this current movement is try to spike numbers and things that are not as high as they're spiking it. But there is, there's a condition of those who have both male and female, sometimes body parts, sometimes chromosomes in that. It, it goes across the spectrum in that. It's very rare. It does not prove transgender. And almost all intersex people live a binary life. In other words, they live either as a male or female. It would actually support that. And, and so when you talk about sex, your body is either a man or a woman. Now you can change parts of your body. You can have surgery, you can alter parts. But, but it was interesting to me, you know, Dr. Allison McGregor, she's an emergency room doctor. She said, when someone comes in, she did a lecture on this. When, when somebody comes in, you have to know as a doctor, no matter what they've done, are they a man or a woman? because your biological sex is expressed down to the cellular level, down to the cellular level. And so whether you've changed that or not, your body is still that, according to science, if you're just gonna start there. Now, here's the second, and here's where it gets confusing. Gender is the psychological, social, and cultural aspects of being male or female. So it's how my brain views myself psychologically. Do I view myself, even though I may have a male body, do I view myself at a brain level as male? Social and cultural, and this is where stereotypes come in and have actually been damaging both in the church and outside in culture, where, where we create a stereotype of what it means to be a man. And all men like certain things and all women act certain way out of that. And, and so if somebody has confusion around that where they look at it and they go, well, I, I don't match up to that. Well, I don't really match there. Or I don't feel that way. Gender dysphoria is the distress some people feel when their internal sense of self doesn't match their biological self. 
So whether at a brain level or an internal level, I may be biologically male, but I don't feel male. And so I don't identify as male or I don't identify as female. And this term gender dysphoria, it's actually a pretty recent term. Uh, the term itself, it comes from uh, the diagnostic manual. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, a medical manual that's used. Up until 2013, this was called gender identity disorder. And it was treated as a disorder. And so medically, how do we treat the disorder? And then it's been changed since 2013 so that there's no stigma. It's called gender dysphoria. It's not conclusive of how it happens. Some have studied the SRY uh, gene and where it attaches, which chromosome it attaches to can have some impact. Some have studied a, a wash of testosterone that happens later in the pregnancy. And so boys that did not get that wash of testosterone or little girls that did get it that can impact the brain, impact the wiring in different ways. It can be culturally created. Sometimes it's based on trauma. You know, Dr. Mark Yarhouse, uh, when he talks about tr transgender, he's a Christian psychiatrist. He says, if you've ever met one transgender person, you've met one transgender person. And, and this would be his point because he works so much with people that he says, you can't just assume that, you know, I'm gonna just do this broad category. And so when you look at that, the categories around that, there's kind of three times that it shows up with it. Early onset, it's really two times and then one subcategory. Early onset, little children, prepubescent. I mean, as early three to six years old can express some confusion around this. And so that's what you're hearing about in culture today, that early onset, and so they're immediately putting hormone blockers and treating it with that. Now, here's the problem with that. Deborah So, in her book, The End of Gender, somewhere between 60 to 90%, depending on the study, if the child is left alone, if the gender that matches their body is actually affirmed, 60 to 90% of the time, it just goes away. Now, you're not hearing that today. You're hearing today, no, you've got to intervene immediately. You've got to do something. You, that's not true. And so as a parent, you don't need to reach a panic point. Little kids can be confused. Little kids can have questions. Now, for those that it continues with that, it is the ongoing gender dysphoria. And so we've got to be careful. We don't just write it all off with that. But we don't have to overreact in the same way the culture does in the certain movement. Uh, some, it's a later adolescent onset. Here's the newest, this rapid onset gender dysphoria. In the last six or seven years, you're seeing this spike, especially among teenage girls, at a rate that doesn't match anything else in the population. And so if somebody were to say, well, we're just accepting it more now, then you would see the same rate across the population. I'm talking like a spike of 4,000 to 5,000%. But this is a pretty radical movement that frankly, one, is destroying so many lives. And two, it's actually hurting people that really do have gender dysphoria that need help. You're listening to Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. Pastor Tim Lundy is our guest teacher today. But before he continues his message, let me quickly share that God has called us to do incredible ministry work all around the world. And when you regularly give to Living on the Edge, you're a part of what we do. So consider becoming a monthly partner today, then visit livingontheedge.org. We appreciate your generous support. Well, with that, here again is Tim. So then when you talk about transgender, this is the umbrella term that describes people whose gender identity or expression does not match the sex they were assigned at birth. So trans means to cross over. Cis means to be on the same side. So if, if you're called cisgender, that means that your biological sex and your gender, they both match. Transgender is someone who they've chosen a gender identity or a gender expression that doesn't match their biological sex. And it can be a number of different ways. Again, I told you there's a spectrum out of that. For some, it's just changing clothes and dressing differently. 
For some, it's taken on characteristics. Some move to medical treatment, whether it's hormone or other treatment. Some move to surgery. Very few move to complete surgery. And so again, when you use the term transgender, it's very umbrella term and you have to be careful that you're speaking to the person and not just the movement. Now I know that's a lot of terms coming at you fast, but I wanted to give you the lay of the land. Now I'm gonna go even faster because we're gonna look at what the Bible says about it. And every one of these verses, I could probably do a sermon. That's not the point today. I just wanna give you a biblical overview. What does the Bible say? The problem with it is there's no place in your biblical concordance that you can type in the word transgender and you go, oh, there's all the verses with transgender in it. That doesn't mean the Bible doesn't speak to it because the Bible has a lot to say about our bodies. It has a lot to say about our sexuality and a lot to say about our identity. So what does it have to say? Let's walk through this together. What does the Bible say? And, and I would say on this, because I'm moving fast out of this, these categories, um, I took them straight out of one of the chapters in Preston Sprinkle's book. I say that so that you know I'm not plagiarizing. I'm not trying to plagiarize. I just used his categories off of it. But first thing, the body is essential to our image bearing status. We're image bearers of God. Genesis 1:27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In fact, that word image, it's also the root word for idols. So when the false cults wanted to show representations of their gods, they made idols. When God wanted to show representation of himself on this planet, what did he choose to do? He chose humanity. And he didn't choose us to be a spirit or spirit forces. He gave us bodies. They're really important to the expression of the full image of God. Both male and female were important to that. The male and female in Genesis 1 are categories of sex, not gender. So when they use the term male and female, he's not talking about genders. He's talking about their sex. And, and so there's not a delinking there. Look at it, the very next verse, God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. One of the core things that they needed to do with their body is actually have sex so that they could fill the earth. The third thing that we see out of this, Adam and Eve's bodies are viewed as sacred. When Eve was created, and we often talk about, you know, he put Adam to sleep and he took one of his ribs. The word there literally means side. And it's interesting, this word in, in Hebrew, selah, it's usually presented, in fact, almost every other reference you'll see it, it talks about the side of a sacred building, like a temple or the tabernacle. From the very beginning, we were created to be temples. Our bodies are temples. In fact, you see it again in the New Testament. What does Paul emphasize to us? Don't you know your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit? This sacred function of the body from the very beginning. Jesus' views of Genesis 1 and 2 are normative. So when Jesus is asking about this, what does he do? He quotes this passage. Here we are thousands of years later, this is what Jesus is referring to. And so if you wanna go, yeah, okay, that was the Old Testament, but what did Jesus say? This is what Jesus said. And he went back to that because it was so important. Paul sees the body as significant for moral behavior and correlates the body to personhood. I've talked to you about in Corinth, there was every form of sexual expression. And one of the problems they had in the church is often people would go see prostitutes because they didn't consider prostitute sex as sex sex because there's no emotional engagement. I mean, it's just, you know, you're paying for it. It's about the lowest form. And Paul says, uh, yeah, but do you not know that your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God with your body. That's why he says in Romans 12, present your body, all of who you are is a living sacrifice because your bodies matter. Scripture prohibits cross-sex behavior. And so if you look at it, Deuteronomy 22.5 a woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does those things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now again, we talked about the complexities of, of dipping back into the Old Testament law, but what are those principles are one just ceremony to Israel, what are those principles that are teaching us moral standards that still apply? 
And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul, when he references the same thing about what women wear, it's referencing those same principles. It's not just the garment itself. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word there is men's things or women's things. And so it's this prohibition of aligning your life to live or to adorn or to present yourself as the opposite sex of what you are. This is Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram, and you've been listening to the first part of our guest teacher, Tim Lundy's message, Transgender Issues and the Bible, which is part of our series, Caring Enough to Confront. Chip will join us here in studio with some additional thoughts about today's program in just a minute. Our world right now can be characterized by one word, divided. There's a dangerous us versus them mindset out there that's invading every aspect of society. And unfortunately, even in the name of holiness, Christians have begun thinking this way too. So when confronted with the hot-button issues of our day, how should followers of Jesus respond? In this vital series, we'll learn the true meaning of being salt and light. Join us as we explore what the Bible says about topics like abortion, politics, and sexuality, and how we are to lead with grace when we engage with those with different beliefs. You're not going to want to miss a single program. Also, throughout this series, Chip and our guest teachers mention many resources to educate you about what's happening in our world and prepare you to respond in a Christ-like way. We've gathered all of these resources together for you, so check out the entire list right now at livingontheedge.org. That's livingontheedge.org. Well, Chip's with me in studio now, and Chip, many of our listeners have heard you talk before about partnering with Living on the Edge financially, but they're unaware of how their support is actually making a difference. So could you take a minute and share how every gift we receive is having a real impact on real people everywhere? I'd be glad to, Dave. You know, I get letters, emails, and Facebook messages from people every day who tell me how Living on the Edge has impacted their life. Mm. People of all ages from, I mean, every walk of life. Many of those letters also share painful events, deep wounds, or hard times that people are wrestling with. Like many of us, they're pressing in, they're seeking God, and I'm deeply moved when they've taken the time to write and say thank you. Thanks for a message they've heard or a resource they've been using or, you know, seeing God work through his word and they understand him and the Holy Spirit is beginning to work in their life like never before. They aren't only thanking me or living on the edge. They're thanking you. All of you that invest in this ministry and walk alongside us by praying for us daily, giving every month to keep the doors open or giving to our matches once or twice a year to develop new resources and reach more people. These folks, they're thanking you too. And so I just want to pause and thank you for your financial investment in all that we do right here at Living on the Edge. And if you're listening and you've never given or didn't realize that we rely on contributions until just now, would you prayerfully consider uh, giving financially to the ministry that we could keep creating new resources, keep helping people to be the kind of Christians that live like Christians? And let me say just Thank you in advance for whatever God leads you to do. You don't need to do more or less. We're just asking everyone, do your part, and we'll see God work. Well, as you prayerfully consider your role with this ministry, I want to remind you that every gift is significant, no matter the amount. When you partner with Living on the Edge, you support and multiply the ministry work we're doing all over the globe. Set up your monthly gift today by going to livingontheedge.org or by calling 888-333-6003. That's 888-333-6003 or visit livingontheedge.org. App listeners, tap donate. Well, with that, here's Chip with a few final thoughts to share. Thanks so much, Dave. We have such confusion in our world about this whole transgender issue. This is happening in our schools, our government. The AMA has come out with some positions on doctors and what they need to say and what they're saying. And and I believe that if there's one thing we as followers of Jesus and especially parents and grandparents need to do is we have to get educated because our kids are being inundated and it's causing havoc There is a reason that 30% of all teenage middle school girls are struggling with confusion, depression, anxiety. They are bombarded with, who am I? If you apply to college today, I have a friend who had 
his daughter apply to Michigan, there were 30 different categories that you could check about your gender as you're applying to this Big Ten school. There is genuine gender dysphoria. It is very, very rare. I mean, way, 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 way less than even 1%. What we have is a social contagion. We have a social media, I don't know who I am, I have these feelings. We have a lot of misinformation. We have a world of people who have always gone through puberty, who have all kind of confusion because it's very, very normal. And as I talked to one leading psychologist, he says about 90% of all that gets cleared up by 16 to 18 to 21, even if we have different feelings and thoughts. But when those things get ignited by social media, when everyone is saying, I don't know who I am, or maybe I'm a girl, or maybe I'm bi, or maybe I'm this, it is a world in crisis. So first and foremost, we wanted to teach on it. And as I sat in church and heard this message, I thought, our listeners need to hear this. Second, parents, you have to get resourced. I've spent time with parents with this issue. And some out of fear are listening to doctors and letting their kids go down a path that is tragic. You need to educate yourself. You need to read. You need to talk. You need to get with your child. You need to walk them through. This is what's true of you. This is your biology. This is who you are. This is God's word. And there's great Christian material that can help you as a parent or a grandparent walk through this journey. But you can't leave this to someone else. This is a crisis, and you need to step in. Absolutely right, Chip. And you know, we want to help educate you moms and dads listening. So let me encourage you to go to livingontheedge.org and check out all the resources mentioned throughout this series. Whether it was something Tim or Chip cited or one of Rebecca McLaughlin's super insightful books, we have everything listed for you. Visit livingontheedge.org today to learn more. Well, thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. Next time, our guest teacher, Tim Lundy, will continue our series, Caring Enough to Confront. I'm Dave Drury, and I hope you'll be with us then. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like to watch more content like this, click and subscribe here to our channel. And by the way, if you'd like to know more about Living on the Edge, find out about more resources, maybe get on the mailing list, go to livingontheedge.org. See you next time.